Jared Stocker. I am Adolfo Ferranda. Now I'm Greg Voria, aka Social Greg on Twitter. So, hey, how's it going, man? Another week. Good, good. Yeah, another week, and uh, getting settled into this this uh, quarantining lifestyle where every day blends into the other. Yeah. What day is it? <laughs> today. Today, today. Man. yeah there's only three days right right yesterday today and tomorrow <laughs> so everyone just to remind you guys that we do have a patreon page so if you are interested and we would love your support especially you know in this time of need i know everyone's in time of need but if you happen to have the extra ability please uh, support us go to our patreon.com forward slash nerd stalker page and uh we would love to uh have even more of your support here please Thank please you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it, huh? Let's get stories into of the it. week. Stories of the week. All right. Um, what's this about sending packages with Uber Connect? I don't know what that is, actually. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, too, is uh, recently the government was talking about how they're not going to. Well, I, let me let me back up here and say that the United States Postal mm. Service was announcing that they were going to be bankrupt, basically, and cannot uh, continue operations past, I believe it's September is what they said. And the government is not. Uh, currently approving any type of funding so it's crazy to think but the postal service could go bye-bye right in the united states which is mind-boggling uh the argument being that uh, fedex and ups would somehow make up the load for it but what i found really interesting was this little story that snuck in here uh today uh, as of this recording by imani bashir at lifehacker that uh yeah mm. uh, uber is offering to send packages to nearby friends uh using uh, uber connect um, so now that we're physically distancing each other, what they're essentially offering is that you, you know, you, it, it'll be the cost of an Uber. You order your Uber and you specify uh, what, you know, your location, obviously, and, and what it's going to be for that. It's going to be one of these Uber Connect type of things. And the driver comes, pops the trunk. So it's a no contact thing. You put your item in the trunk and then they go to the destination, pop the trunk or the recipient grabs the thing from the trunk and closes the trunk and the driver's gone. So that's it, right? There's a no touch type of thing. So the driver doesn't have to touch anything or be involved much in this besides driving. I found it really fascinating. It will be the cost of a actual Uber ride. So that there's that premium right, to think about. Uh, but it's really neat as a uh, sort of alternative uh, to you know, a mail or a quick uh, delivery service, a bicycle, as we know in a lot of urban cities, we do uh, bicycle delivery, same day stuff uh, between companies. Oh, yeah. But I, I found oh, this yeah. as a really creative way. And what Uber's trying to do is find other means for these uh, gig workers to, uh, to, you know, to supplement, get, get more income. And, and it seems like a creative sort of option here. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, yeah, let's talk about postal service and what it provides you. So, at your house in the suburbs, you're you're right north of me. What what does the postal service really give you these days? Well, you know, what I do find uh, as far as the United States Postal Service is that uh, people who of not uh, let's say middle or upper income means it gives them a way to deliver letters, right? A stamp. Think of think of the cost of a stamp. Uh, whether well, a lot of people still pay their bills this way too you know, sure, um, sure. via paper. So that could be a demographic thing as well. Uh, so there's that to think about. So it's, it's just kind of weird to think, but the, you're right. They do. Well, if you're getting to the point, they do deliver packages and uh, letters, I guess, correspondence to that extent too. And what else we got PO boxes. Um, and I can't think of much else. Yeah. I, I think for us here in San Francisco, um, I get um, circular ads still, you know, from the local supermarkets. You get mm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so someone has to provide that service. So that could get privatized, mm. I guess. I right. Think, I don't think Uber really wants to do that, but maybe they do. Um, or That's UPS a great point. Um, yeah, so because that is cheaper mail. marketing. Bulk mail, right? I mean, that's... And cheap marketing, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we get all the government till um stuff through there like uh voting and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. that's another thing i can think about that has to be fulfilled somehow mm -hmm. um let's see what else um, i wonder I'm if they pretty... do any kind of passport service or something like that there are services yeah. I, I don't know if they do yeah, yeah. there's government mm -hmm. i i think there's government connected services that goes fairly easily through the usps mm -hmm. so if they mm -hmm. had to dismantle that completely 
which I can't imagine, but if they had to, um, that's just another thing that the governor, uh, the, uh, the governor, the government has to reattach itself to, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just totally crazy, right? I mean, um, you know, my mailman comes every day, he's, he or she is just, you know, gloved up, masked, everything, mm -hmm. but, yeah, mm -hmm. they do it every day, you know, so. Yeah. So anyways, getting back to this uh, Uber Connect thing, um, yeah. what, what they said too is that the limitation will be that the packages will have to be 30 pounds or less, obviously, and fit into a mid-size ve mid vehicle, and the value should, should be $100 or less. Um, and there are terms and conditions which is and isn't allowed. No drugs, uh, no alcohol or medicine, nothing illegal or dangerous, of course. And they're only available currently in the following cities, Austin, Baltimore, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Houston, Miami, New Orleans, Orlando, Phoenix, San Antonio, Tampa Bay, and Washington, D.C. Whoa. Okay. I mean, those are fairly decent sized populations there, right? Yeah. I mean, they could test oh. it out fairly easily is the concept, I guess. Uh, yeah. So it's, know. I don't know. I just found that interesting. All right. Next story. Robots, let's, robots, robots. Oh, let's go share the screen here. Excuse me. I'm sharing. Can you see my screen right now? I, think I can. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks to ZDNet uh, for this and um, Mr. Greg Nichols. I appreciate that. Um, you know, this isn't new. Uh, robots and delivery services, I think, you know, they started to pop out in what, five, six years ago, you know, at least the concept and prototypes and stuff like that. But, you know, now they're saying that like, maybe, maybe it's time that this could get rolled out, right? Um, for adoption. And I, and I started to read about it. I was sort of like, hell, yeah, what's been holding it up, right? So I've been going down, it's really, you know, it's legislative, it's, 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 it's purely legislative, you know? Can, <laughs> And one of the one of the arguments I've always heard, and I want to discuss this with you, is, is that like I can see the suburbs not being a problem for this, but like in a crowded city, having robots go up and down the street, on, you know, randomly, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, it'll start to get crowded, you know. So I, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to hear your kind of take on like, you know, is, do you think it, the time is ripe to kind of adopt this, maybe, or is it like a limited area where they could adopt this? What, what do you what do you think about these robot things? I'll stop sharing a little bit here. Yeah, um, I, I have two two concerns with this, right? or maybe more. Uh, one is the loss of jobs, right? So I'm never in favor of loss of jobs. Now I understand that we're going to probably use the excuse that this is going to reduce um, human contact in this time of um, quarantining and virus concerns, and perhaps who knows? Maybe this is the concern to go forward forever. Now this is something that we're going to have to somehow design our work around. And robots uh, are a a possible alternative to one solution for this type of challenge. Uh, another one is just logistical issues. Like if the robots that Greg showed in his uh, screen sharing, for those of you just listening, is it was a small sort of robot about the size of, I don't know, like what was that, the size of like a dog or something like that, right? And something like that on the sidewalk versus, um, yeah, I don't know. Here in the suburbs, we have questionable sidewalks um, every now and then, and you're sharing that with people with baby carriages. Who has the right of way? What does the what does the robot do? Does the robot leave the sidewalk? Does it go on the street? Then it has to go around cars. Will it get run over by cars? So there's all these weird logistical sort of concerns with with stuff like that, right? Um, so. I, I don't know. I think it may have its place in maybe an urban area where it's designated as 100% safe for the robot to somehow get around humans to some extent. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's it. I, th I think there's a lot of open questions. So basically jobs and logistics is, is my two concerns <laughs> with this uh, yeah. particular alternative. Yeah. Point well taken. I, I think that, you know, uh, I, I have, I have the same concerns as well as just, you know, I'm thinking like piracy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, well, what do you mean? Or just that? Like, like, like picking like, up the like thing people and walking picking away? up the robot. And, yeah, you know, yeah, walking away. Yeah, man. I'm just gonna go with this baby. You know, I, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how difficult or you know, it, that is. I'm sure they thought about this. I'm not the first person to think about this, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm sure. Right. I know there's been some pizza delivery cars. Uh, robots that have been outfitted, but that's a car. So yeah, to your point, someone can't just pick up a car and walk away with it. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, with these so, little guys. Who, I, so know. I could see in the previous um, 
you know, segment that you did about Uber, I could see that mm -hmm. being more practical than, right. than robots at this point. I mean, to, and, and to your point, I think it's, it's, it's this thing that we're seeing um, as we start to enter, we're not there yet, the post-COVID stages, Mm -hmm. um, of where all this stuff is going to redistribute itself, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, what's going to emerge, what's going to die, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, all that stuff. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, reading articles every day about that, you know? That, right, you know, right. People, the pundits, uh, you know, thoughts about, you know, what the world will look like and everything, the futurists, you know, and, and, yeah, I think maybe a better solution for in this particular scenario would be maybe drones. Uh, I know Amazon was trying to fast track zone flight and using this uh, this quarantine issue because it was uh, a lot of FAA restrictions and and to your what to your point a lot of uh, legal and political stuff hurdles uh, boundaries that were uh, barriers that were holding up the rollout of this technology. I think that would be safer because then people can't as to your point, pick something up and just steal it right there. It's a drone in the sky. So it would come to your backyard or it, assuming you even have a backyard or whatever, or your front door or something like that. Uh, assuming you don't live in an apartment building. Right? Well, as staying with the kind of unmanned or robotic theme, uh, Boston dynamics spot, the robot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So speaking of dogs and robots, uh, Boston Dynamics Spot Robot Dog helps doctors assess coronavirus patients. So to this example, um, basically in a nutshell here, it's, uh, I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror, which is scary. There's a dog, robotic dog, uh, and Boston Dynamics has, and you can probably see it online too on YouTube. There's several videos um, where this thing is that what they've done is they've sort of placed an iPad where you can do FaceTime and attach it to the top of the robotic Boston Dynamics dog. And this uh, dog, particular dog, can just uh, traverse through hospitals, right, uh, as a, a, tele, a telemedicine solution. So what they're saying here is uh, Dr. Spot is in, by Nam Boston Dynamics dog-like quad quadruped robot is helping to protect medical staff at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston during the coronavirus virus, uh, pandemic. Uh, the company hopes robots can reduce the exposure of doctors and staff to COVID-19 and help hospitals conserve scarce PPE, right? Personal protective equipment supplies. So that's another upside, right? Of uh, No humans apparently is less equipment needed. Spot work falls in line with similar robotic efforts to ease the strain on healthcare systems. Robots took over for humans at the field hospital in Wuhan, China in March, for example, giving medical staff a much needed break. I didn't, I never knew that. That's fascinating to know that. Uh, Spot has now been through a successful test run at telemedicine platform as a telemedicine platform at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston Dynamics equipped Spot with an iPad, as I mentioned, and a two-way radio that lets the hospital staff communicate with patients who are lined up for initial health assessments. Uh, for every intake, shift completed by a teleoperated robot shift, at least one healthcare provider is able to reduce their interaction with the disease. Telemedicine is just the beginning, the beginning for Spot's possible, possible medical uses. Uh, Boston Dynamics is now investigating ways to equip the robot with the ability to measure key vital signs such as temperature and oxygen saturation. Fascinating. Spot could also become part of cleaning crews needed for hospitals and public spaces by attaching a UVC light and other technology to the robot's back, Spock could use the device to kill virus particles and disinfect surfaces in an unstructured space that needs support in decontaminations, be it in hospital tents or metro stations. Um, so robots have been stepped up through the pandemic. Human-sized rolling telepresence robots are uh, for graduating students. You've seen in Japan, robots also helped enforce lockdown rules, robots, uh, COVID-19 systems, robots, robots, robots everywhere, right? Um, so the hope is they want to get these things out in, in a real-life scenario. I just found this scenario really fascinating. Well, that's cool. I, I mean, I think we're, we're seeing now you know, like because of this this thing that we're in of like social distancing and as well as just, you know, risk, right? Um, we seem to be, we seem to be approaching um, the robotics side as as the solution to risk, right? Of, of, of getting people in harm's way as opposed to something like, you know, I, I guess it was, it's equivalent of like, you know, 
you know, the, the ro- robotic bomb sniffer, right? You okay. know, <laughs> instead of having a person there, you're going to have, you know, you have a robot go in and kind of like, you know, it gets blown up, it gets blown up, you know, I mean, right. so it's interesting how, how we're approaching. Yeah, I mean, the cleaning, the cleaning scenario was fascinating with just the UV light, because uh, you just stick one of those in a room and get humans out of there and boom, the entire room is disinfected. And that UV light is dangerous for humans. Um, so it's interesting that a robot could just go from place to place and you don't have to worry about necessarily, well, I suppose you do still scrub things down to an extent, but uh, the, the benefit of the UV light is you know, it doesn't matter the surface, it's just a light, right? So right. It, whatever it exposes to, you're, it's, it's killing the bacteria on it. Um, the, the flip side, as we mentioned again, is jobs, right? So this means sort of man, jan- janitorial jobs that will be um, scaled down to God knows what extent, uh, medical jobs, right? That will be scaled down to, to an extent too. Uh, you'll need fewer. So there's pros and cons, obviously, right? There's productivity and safety pluses, but there's employment downsides. And it brings up those concerns and questions. And where do those jobs go, especially in this, in this, when we're approaching this mass, mass unemployment time? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go um, into my maker head and uh, hack my Roomba right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll hack that. Right. I'll put a UV light on my Roomba right now. So, all right, my man. So, seven tips. What well, do you got here? Every every week, what we do is I want to go through and just kind of go through a quick thing with Adolfo here and ask him, okay, would you do this? So, I found seven tips of uh, getting rid of your creative block. So, I do a lot of um, film and video editing, and some days I'm just not feeling it. You know, either I just I'm not in the right mood or whatever. Um, and Adolfo, I know that. You do a lot of creative things, so I want to go through this list with you. You know, thanks to um, see um, Bit Rebels uh, for this Bit Russell Rebels. Campbell. Yeah, I love the. Thank you. I, yeah, I love these guys. Um, so anyway, um, when you get into a creative rut, there's there's suggestions that they have here, and I'm going to read them out to you. Um, implement a routine. Yes, I love. It. Yeah, that very would help helpful. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, get inspired. I, this was kind of weird to me, but <laughs> of course, I'm not, I'm not inspired right now. So, so I guess what they're say, saying is that um, uh, turning to sides. movies, music, books, other art forms mm-hmm. to kind of get back on track is what, what they're trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, that good for you? Yeah, yeah. What's funny about that too is sometimes just uh, being bored inspires me. I should say, oh, or motivates me to to get off my butt and make something or do something. That's cool. Uh-huh. Yeah, and we're going to go into some things you can do outdoors a little later there. Cool. Um, uh, take a break. You, do you hmm. feel like stepping away from something? If you, Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Helps you reset. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> change a location. This is kind of weird, but uh, especially now, now yeah. times. But I mean, yeah, I guess you could change location in your house, go outside for a little bit, come back in. Yeah, uh, even change rooms. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Yeah. yeah. Great point. Um, Make notes. This was interesting. Um, so I guess it, they're trying to get your mind away from the problem. So just by just tallying. Yeah. Things, um, I know there's a lot of, a lot of people who, uh, when they sketch when they're just, you know, sketch and it helps them just sort of think or, or, you know, what we've mentioned before, mind mapping too, just sort of brainstorming oftentimes. That's kind of a form of sort of like note taking or something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's I can shake up way. ideas. Yeah, yeah. Out of your head. Yeah. Yeah, just see the interconnections because I think sometimes what I, I find myself is I, I get disconnected from what I'm supposed to do and like I can't mm. get back on that track again. Mm. Yeah, so, for sure. So, okay, I get that. Routine. Um, here's another one. Disconnect. Step away Disconnect. completely. Oh, you bet. Yeah. yeah, you bet. Yeah, for sure. I know there's a big movement now for people to do a personal retreat. I've done one once mm. and it helps. It really was super beneficial. Did, did it refresh in your mind when you got back into the yeah, world again? Yeah, it gives you a whole new juice and, you know, you, it gives you a whole other outlook that you can possibly do. It depends what your goal is really, right? But yeah, I definitely think uh, disconnecting is is probably should be in a, an essential thing for everyone at least, I don't know, once a year at least. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. I, I meditate you know, twice a day, so I think that's... There you go. Disconnecting. Yeah. Um, now, getting organized now, I'm not the most neatest person, so this is going to be a really big challenge to me. Um, 
making yeah, sure absolutely. that everything's organized in your space, you know? Yeah, yeah. I have to do the same thing because I, you know, I have uh, ADD and uh, if I used to live that way with lots of clutter and stuff and then I just could not function because I was bouncing from from pile to pile and I've discovered late in life that the more organized things are for me and clean the things are for me, uh, the less things, uh, rabbit holes, as you would say, uh, I would go down. I agree with that. I, right, I, right. I'm the I'm the same way. I'm still the same way. So I'm trying set to yourself them. up for success. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't even know how I'm even successful at this point to even do that. <laughs> but but you know I've made, I've made it through life. You know. You're the employed I, one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know I have been totally. Uh, A great example uh, of going into the speed round. <laughs> All right, speed round. So Nextdoor and Walmart are partnering on a new neighborly assistant program. Uh, I, you know, to me, it sounds like an overblown sort of uh, message board, but <laughs> it's great PR for Walmart. Uh, neighborhood social network Nextdoor and Walmart are teaming up today as of this recording to launch a new Neighbors Helping Neighbors program that will make it easier for vulnerable community members to get assistance from neighbors who are already planning a trip to Walmart. The new in-app feature will allow next door users to post to groups associated with their local Walmart store to request shopping assistance. To find the new option, Nextdoor users can either use the Nextdoor website or mobile app. From there, users will click on the groups tab and they'll see local Walmart stores pinned to the top of their page. Members can then post a message to the group feed and ask where they can ask for help or offer help to others. Members who connect in the feed can then work out the details on the message board or through direct message where they can share some more private details like the address and what they need from the store. Uh, the feature is designed to help elderly, high risk or other vulnerable members find someone to help pick up groceries, medications or other essentials that they're planning on the trip to the store. This could offer a low or no cost alternative to using online grocery delivery services that we've talked about in the past, which require tipping. In the case of the neighbor helping a neighbor, the assistance is offered on a volunteer basis, not as someone's job. This could be potentially life-saving for low-income communities, members who can't risk shopping in a store during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, but also struggle to afford alternatives like online, online grocery. Uh, Walmart isn't moderating or managing these next uh, Nextdoor groups, to be clear, uh, but worked with Nextdoor to make the feature available. For the retailer, the addition isn't just a beneficial in terms of directing customers to Walmart to shop. It's also seen as a way to reduce the number of people who come to the store in person. Um, so kudos to those guys for rolling this out. It's launching uh, ASAP and uh, there'll be help maps and, and other things. And um, yeah, uh, just a sort of inspiring thing. All right, uh, speed round. Yeah. Okay, pendulum thinking. I'm always a sucker for this kind of new way of thinking about design and engineering and all this stuff. So, so uh, what what this uh, company based out of Tokyo and uh, they have offices in London, I believe as well, has talked about this thing called pendulum thinking, which overcomes the tension between design and engineering. They said and speculative thinking and tangible concepts, all this stuff, into more of a robust. Uh, product development cycle and 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 what what they're they're saying is um they really believe or at least the founder uh, kenya is his name of tacram uh, based in tokyo today the creative process requires the organic integration of multiple specialties and expertise calling for us to cross the boundaries of various disciplines instead of handling the elements separately we must consider them as an integrated whole and connect them and weave them together to tackle complexity without simplification um, I think I think the issue is in the previous cycle is they converge on a on a one little plan or one little solution, but problems that it's trying to solve is really more complex than that. So they're just asking, you know, get more of the stakeholders involved. I, I, I think it's just another way of saying some things that I've seen in the past of just, you know, getting multiple stakeholders involved in the product development process. But I think they've, they've kind of... Uh, come up with a process here. So I, I don't know. I just wanted you guys kind of think about that and kind of, you know, chew on that a little bit when you're doing your next uh, product development, startup, design, whatever. So. Very nice. Pendulum thinking. <laughs> All right. So Vox has a story, uh, which is in response to Mark Andreessen. He 
did a viral post. Mark Andreessen is a venture capitalist, uh, very, very successful venture capitalist and creator, one of the co-creators of Netscape and Mozilla. And he, he is the crux of his, his story was that America needs to build, right? And that uh, why, and the example being that we don't have, we didn't build, we're in this position where we don't have enough ventilators, masks and anything because we don't build or make our own things anymore. Uh, now this uh, Vox article by Ezra Klein is called we, Why We Can't Build America's Inability to Act is Killing People. And in essence, what he's saying is a counter to Andreessen's point. Andreessen is very much a venture capitalist, very much a pull your own bootstraps kind of guy and just says, you know, we need just to, we need to just stop complaining and go out and build stuff, right? And as the United States needs to do this and get building everyone, go do it. Um, now the, the basis of this article is someone who had a lot of this, this author was had a lot of insight into Washington DC and how it works and to Greg, your point earlier, uh, the crux of the article's counter argument is that it isn't that we can't build and we don't want to build, it is the system itself, the political system that has way too many veto power abilities to kibosh all of these initiatives to build. Uh, there's no shortage of, um, so the joke in Washington, one of the jokes in Washington that he said is every day is infrastructure day. Right, infrastructure building day, because there are tons of these initiatives that are put in front of our local politicians or, or federal politicians as well. And they're just kibosh because of the, the stark sides that we stand on the far right and far left and the lack of, of compromise anymore, because it used to be back in the day we could get things done. Was like, well, the question was, how do we get these things done back in the day? Uh, our parties were much more mixed and they were more apt to compromise, whereas now it's very, very not mixed in terms of a spectrum of political views. You're either far right or far left. There really is no in-between anymore, and thus no incentive anymore to uh, compromise, as well as uh, typically now we're seeing one wing of government that has the majority of control, and the other one does not, and then you have the use of things called filibusters, which could stop initiatives as well. So the argument in this article is that um, what, what, is, what is needed first before any rebuilding of America, because that will be and has been an ongoing failed uh, experiment as of the past decade, is a complete rebuild of the political system itself. And this whole notion of giving so many people so many veto powers and anyone can, can destroy it. And how he also points out that this isn't just on the federal level, this is also on a local level. That local government also has too many veto rights and, and political powers to stop initiatives too, and that we just can't get anything done. And the things that get done are typically big and not very good type of initiatives, and in that the smaller, very important initiatives, the majority of them are not getting through. So again, just give it a, give it a read. It's a sort of a long sort of read and uh, very insightful. Oh, no, thank you. I, I think it has a lot to think about, especially in these days. I mean, I think the ventilator thing was the, an example of that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a current one. example of that, right? So, anyway, speed round. Speed round. Oh. Nineteen projects. All right, I'm going to go through. No, I'm not going to go through all nineteen projects, but I'm going <laughs> to say. Thank you. That, <laughs> but I'm going to say, check out this article. We have uh, linked uh, below, um, which is from Make. You know, now that I've kind of thought about Make a little bit more, Make Magazine. Um, they have an article, if you get bored and you want to do something outside, here are 19 projects to keep your mind, uh, like ADD Greg and ADD Adolfo, uh, busy <laughs> or not. <laughs> you know, once we get bored, we'll probably go to the next one and the next one and the next one. But, but anyway, um, you know, it goes anywhere from uh, 15 minutes stilts <laughs> to, to uh, making your own indoor composter. <laughs> so oh, nice. Do. Yeah. So, you know, check it out below and uh, let's, let's go on. Let's go on, man. Oh, nice. That's, those, are, that, those are like good tips, like tip time. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So recently my 2015 MacBook Pro, which I love to death, uh, has been the batteries draining super quickly every time i have to keep it on a power strip or connected to a power supply all the time which is kind of negating the use of a or the benefits of a laptop to some extent right um so what i've discovered is that my battery is draining 
because it's so damn old. And what I didn't know is that there was a feature, and I should have known this, I just never had the uh, interest to find out <laughs> until this particular motivation, was that there was something called cycle count, right? So your battery has a X amount of cycle count, meaning a recharge, amount of times that you can re recharge your lithium ion battery, right, in your device before it just says, you know, I just can't hold much anymore in me. Um, and it's time to replace me. And so I've been on eBay, oddly enough, and there's some really great uh, sales in terms of people who have low cycle count batteries. And that's what you want to look for. That's a good little tip here, guys, is if you're on eBay or somewhere else and you are shopping for a battery for your laptop, that you want to look for that low cycle count number. And to check your, the tip being here, one another one, is to check your own laptop. If you are on a Mac, you go up to the Apple in the upper left-hand corner, you go to About This Mac, and then you click on the System Report. And then a window comes up for your particular system on this on the System Report, and then you click on the far left column, something Power. And then on the right there, Towards the middle, under the health information of your battery, you'll see something that says cycle count. Now, mine is at 1,578 cycles. So that is how many times I have powered up this battery and it has charged and discharged. That is a ton. You definitely want to be under that. And under that uh, information, you'll have something that says condition and mine says replace soon. <laughs> and it should say dying rapidly. Uh, now, obviously, when you get a new one, you probably want to get something between two, three hundred cycle count is a good number, something like that, and then go from there, or maybe oh, wow. a little more. Wow. So, yeah, I just a little tip in terms of battery life for your device. Oh, man. That was a good tip. Thank you. I, I didn't You're even welcome. know that. I'm going to go well, I'm gonna go check my MacBook now. <laughs> you got me like, paranoid. <laughs> so tip time, tip time. Tip time, tip time. Okay. Well, then my, my new friend out of New York, Daniel Bennett, who's a jazz musician and a teacher at, at a local um, conservatory, cool. um, he got me thinking about this. He was struggling with his... Uh, his cork on his bottle. It sounds kind of weird, but yeah, okay. Well, no, mm -hmm. no jokes out there, everyone. Cork. On. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we all struggle with our cork. Maintain on the bottle, low right? voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> and so, you know, what he what he did was is he actually took one of those like um, um, uh, screws he used for like drywall. You know, it's kind of, kind of like has a spiral. Yeah. Went into it and then used a hammer. But then I thought about that. Like I've run into that problem a couple of times where I'm, I'm out somewhere. And we don't, you know, we either forgot the darn, you know, corkscrew or, you know, the place where we're at doesn't have one for some reason. So yeah. I, went, I went and looked at different ways you could actually open up your, uh, open up your cork bottle. So he, at the end of the day, what he ended up doing was really, um, and I've done this before, I, you know, and I, you know, wine enthusiasts do not, you know, turn away from this and do not listen to this because this hey, is it's a he yeah. just pushed the damn cork in there and was just all these things and he didn't do ah, it. He just wanted yes, to drink it. Hey, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I, Adolfo used to do a lot of this, so he knows mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. what fine wine would taste like with cork in it or yeah, not. not good. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say so, fine wine, but... Mm -hmm. Some of the suggestions was to actually um, take a wooden spoon and push the whole cork in without destroying it. Just mm. push it in. That's... Mm. Okay. I, I, that's actually makes sense to me, you know. Sure. Um, and then uh, pump it out was kind of an interesting one. So basically take a bike needle, put it into the cork, and pump it. And yeah. so basically the pressure inside there will push the cork out. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that cool? Wow. Isn't that cool? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Clever. you know, twist it out with keys or a serrated knife. Now, I never tried that. That seems like it'll, it'll break the cork up. But, you know, that's, that's me. But that's what I think about it. Um, Wrap the bottle with a towel and use the wall to smack it out. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Have you have you seen that? I haven't seen uh, that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, slap it out with a shoe. <laughs> slap it out with a shoe. Wow. Yeah. So so what they're saying there is that basically, um, you know, you put it uh, upside down between your legs and then while sitting slap it like, with the shoe give it a then, spanking yeah mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. okay <laughs> i know uh, apply heat to the bottle and move the cork out i thought that was kind of clever i didn't think yeah, that's that. interesting yeah but anyway you guys could see all those and see which one you you know put it on your bookmarks and then when you're in the next place you don't have a corkscrew 
guess what? You have seven solutions to do that. Okay. Very nice. Thank wow. you, Greg. All right, everyone. Well, thanks everyone for listening again to another episode of Nerd Stalker. We appreciate all of your support. And if you could please give us a thumbs up or a like or a nice review on the, your podcast service of choice, we would greatly appreciate it. Share this, tell your friends. Again, check us out at our patreon.com forward slash Nerd Stalker account. And, um, Thank you so much. I am Adolfo Fronda at NerdStalker on Twitter and Greg. I'm Greg Lurie, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter for the NerdStalker Media Network. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everyone. See you. All right. Be careful out there. I have no fear.